remember we are always in the presence of God. So let us begin with a short prayer, and then we will start our presentation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for this holy season of Lent. As we reflect on the thousands of years of Christians' path through human history, and explore the ancient roots of our worldwide family of faith, may we hear the Spirit guiding us to appreciate our past and launch onward to our ultimate goal of eternal life with you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Tonight's session is titled Eucharistic Miracles, and it's presented by Richard Bernacci. Mm -hmm. Richard Bernacci has been making Eucharistic Miracles presentations as part of Faith-Based Communications Apostolate for five years. He and Pat, his wife of 49 years, have been active in religious education at the parish level and have adopted 11 children from various nations. Both have Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering and Master's in Engineering Administration degrees and Dick is a professional engineer. Please join me in welcoming Richard Benassi. Thank you, Kay. Yeah, so my name is Dick Bernacci. My wife, Pat, and I, we travel around the country to various uh, parishes, schools, and religious communities, bringing what we hope are faith-building experiences. Uh, as you're very much aware, this evening we're doing Eucharistic Miracles. Uh, we have Vatican's International Exhibition of Eucharistic Miracles of the World and the presentation that accompanies it. But in addition, we also have a project involving uh, the shot at Turin, and uh, we have a passion exhibit. And our presentation on the shroud, uh, it actually is entitled The Sacred Cloth of the Passion, and we talk about the shroud at Turin, which most people are familiar with. Uh, the Sidarium of Oviedo, which is the cloth that covered Jesus' head from the time he expired on the cross until the time he was set in the tomb. And then the tunic of Argente, which very few people are familiar with, which was the seamless garment that Jesus would have worn throughout his passion. And uh, we have scientific evidence on that, that he actually did sweat blood uh, during his agony. And we show how these three cloths that have been reverenced uh, by people for 2,000 years and have been completely detached from each other throughout that time, a science is now showing us we're all once in touch with the very same person. Last evening after my presentation, this little boy came up to me and he tugged at my sleeve and he said, hey mister, when I grow up I'm going to get a job and when I get my paycheck I'm going to give you some money. <laughs> I you know, thought about that and I said, I said, well, you know, that's great, but what, what's your motivation for doing this? He said, well, after your presentation, I was listening to my dad, and he said, you were the poorest speaker he had ever heard. <laughs> so you've been adequately warned. Uh, I need a volunteer that will help me here for just a few moments. All right, I'm up here. Okay, I'm going to tell this story about miracles that take place in Poznan and Poland. <laughs> Okay. okay, and I'd like you to keep track of how many miracles are in this story. Okay. And as you hear each miracle, I want you to add an additional finger up, okay? okay? But really, it's up to them to signal to you by waving to you whenever they hear a miracle as part of the story so that you know when to put up an additional finger. Okay. So we get to the end of the story. If you don't have the right number of fingers up, it's because they're not paying attention, not okay. that you've done anything wrong. Fair okay, enough? I'm going to try to keep track, too. All right, <laughs> wonderful. Okay, so we have three unscrupulous men, and they bribed a servant girl in order to steal three consecrated hosts. And as soon as they received those hosts, they started to pierce them with sharp objects, and blood spurted out of the hosts. And there was a young girl nearby, and she was blind, and some of that blood happened to go on her eyes, and she immediately recovered her sight. All these men tried everything they could think of to try and destroy these hosts, and nothing would work. So they finally decided to take them out to a swamp and to bury them there. Well, a short time later, a dad and his son brought their cattle here to this place to graze. And the dad left the cattle there with his son and went off to town. And while I was there, 
The son noticed that all the cattle were going over to this one spot. They were getting down on their front haunches, bringing their heads down close to the ground. He thought that was rather mysterious. So he goes over to investigate, and as he got closer, he could see these three bright objects above their head just floating there. And when he got closer still, he realized that those bright objects were actually hosts. So he knelt down in prayer there before our Lord. Eventually, he saw his dad returning from town. He runs over to his dad, 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 you've got to see what's happening with our cattle and these hosts that are just floating, giving off this great bright light. At first, his dad didn't believe him, but he went over and investigated, confirmed his son was telling the truth, knelt down and joined him in prayer. Well, after a while, he turned to his son and he said, well, I need to go to town and tell people what's happening here. So he heads off to town. Everybody he meets, he tells what's happening out there with the cattle and these hosts giving off this bright light. The people thought he was crazy. They locked him up in prison. So what happened to St. Peter when they locked him up in prison? Angels opened the prison door, right? Well, basically, this guy had the same type of experience. He discovered that his cell door was not locked. He was able to go out. And again, he's out there in the town telling everybody what's happening. So he finally gets the attention of the clergy uh, and all the town officials, and they decide to press out, process out to this uh, swamp to investigate. And when they get there, the bishop begins to pray, and those hosts just gradually descend down into the picks that he's holding, and he's able to recover them. Everybody heads back to town. When they get to town, they have a big, big meeting. What is this all about? What should we do about it? And while they're having the meeting, the hosts fly up into the air and go back to the swamp again. <laughs> well, at that point, the fig people figured that the intent was rather evident, and they ended up building an improvised sanctuary there on the spot, which was eventually replaced by this magnificent basilica that was paid for by the king of Poland. And you could actually see a stained glass window within the basilica with the host with the puncture marks there within them. So how do we do? I say nine. Nine. Very, very good. I, I always can Am tell. I over one? <laughs> you, you, you're fine. Uh, th thank you very much for your help. But I can always tell when there's some Polish people in the group <laughs> because they always figure that the fact that the uh, king of Poland paid for the uh, basilica was a miracle, <laughs> so we end up with nine instead of eight. <laughs> so what are we talking about this evening? Transubstantiation. Of course, it's the term that the Catholic Church uses to describe the miracle that takes place during each and every Mass, whereby the bread and wine are changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus. So within the definition of transubstantiation, it tells us further that prior to the consecration, it looks and tastes like bread and wine, but after the consecration, it still tastes and looks like bread and wine. So the miracles we're we'll talking about this evening are situations in which something that we can detect with our senses beyond the normal miracle of transubstantiation. Okay? Within my presentation, we're going to go discuss the scriptural basis of the true presence of Jesus within the Blessed Sacrament. I'll introduce the Vatican's exhibit that we have on display, give you some examples of Eucharistic miracles, explore some of the scientific study that's been done, and then we'll end with a review of some of the modern Eucharistic miracles that are taking place, basically as we sit here this evening. So you don't think that just because many of these miracles took place centuries ago that it's not an ongoing phenomenon. It is ongoing. It's happening today. Scripturally, it began with our Lord teaching his disciples, and he announced to them, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. So how did the disciples respond to that message? They walked away. They walked away. They ran away, right? He said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? They went off looking for a rabbi with a much easier message to grasp because this sounded too much like cannibalism. But as you know, Jesus was often teaching in parables. And at the end of each day, he would sit down with the apostles and he would explain to the apostles the symbolism within those parables. But that's not what happened this day. 
when he sat down with the apostles, he said, are you going to leave me also? So the message was quite clear. He wasn't speaking in parables that day. He meant exactly what he was saying. And of course, St. Peter turned to Jesus and said, No, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Of course, then we have the Last Supper, when our Lord instituted the sacrament of the Eucharist. In the words he used, he said, Take and eat, this is my body with a cup of wine and he said drink of it for this is my blood so his words were very clear again no symbolism he meant exactly what he was saying and for 2,000 years priests have been using these very same words of our Lord Jesus to consecrate and change the bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord so why do we have these really special Eucharistic miracles Basically, the reminder from Jesus of his true presence, the gift that's been provided to us. But like any gift, unless you open it and accept it, it doesn't do you any good. But they're there, and if we accept these gifts, they provide us the graces to enhance our faith. But keep in mind that these Eucharistic miracles are not part of the dogma or the doctrine of the Church. That means we do not have to accept them. We can leave that gift just sitting there, unopened. This is what I like to call triggers of Eucharistic miracles. With something that happens just prior to one of these special miracles. And they basically fall into four categories. Unfortunately, unfortunately the first involves a doubting priest. Then we have stolen hosts or desecrated hosts, or some type of physical calamity. This miracle takes place in Balsina, in Italy, and it begins with a doubting German priest. His name is Peter of Prague. And at the moment of the consecration, the host changed into bleeding flesh. And as you can imagine, his belief in the true presence was immediately restored. And it just so happened that Pope Urban IV was making his home in the town of Orvieto at the time that this incident took place. And word of mouth spread, he heard about the fact that this had happened, and he put together a commission to go uh, interview all the people who witnessed this miracle as it took place. And at the end of the investigation, he concluded that it was, in fact, an authentic Eucharistic miracle. And he created the Feast of Corpus Christi that we celebrate every year within the church calendar as a result of this miracle. And then he had this tremendous basilica built there in Orvieto to house some of the sacred objects associated with this miracle, which includes the corporal, which had blood stains, as well as the altar that had blood stains associated with the sacred species in this miracle. Now, in the case of stolen hosts, they fall into three very different subcategories. And the first is no intent on the part of the thieves to actually steal host. What they want is something that they can sell for monetary gain. Gold, silver, precious stones that might be in a monstrance. Okay? In the second category, the hosts are intentionally stolen to be used in some form of satanic ritual. I was recently listening to a conversion story of Betty Brennan and she'd been very high within the satanic religion. And she talks about the fact that a satanic witch, if she's presented with a bushel basket full of unconsecrated hosts, and there's one consecrated host there within the basket, she can reach out and find that consecrated host because she can detect the presence of Jesus there. Jesus within the Blessed Sacrament is often used when they're doing exorcisms in order to drive out satanic possessions. Within the Maronite orders, they have, as part of the holy orders, when the bishop is creating a new priest, he places one hand on the Blessed Sacrament and the other hand on the head of the person 
facing. They don't blame hands a lot in order to make them a priest, bringing the power directly from the Blessed Sacrament into that new priest. And then there have been times when people, out of excessive zeal and devotion, have stolen hopes because they just wanted Jesus physically present with them at all times. But of course, that's something we should never, ever consider doing. This miracle takes place in Siena, in Italy. And the thieves go in the tabernacle and they take out the ciborium and on the way out of church, they take the lid off and they notice there's all these hosts in there. Well, they don't want those. They just want something they can sell for monetary gain. So they take the hosts and they just dump them into a box, a poor box, on the way out of church. Three days later, one of the parishioners is dropping a coin in the poor box and he can see this host that's suspended in the cobwebs. So he goes and notifies the pastor and he comes and unlocks the box and they discover that there are 351 consecrated hosts there within the box. Well, it's very dirty and cobwebby, and they didn't think it was safe to consume those hosts. So they figure, well, we'll just set them aside, and with a short period of time, they'll deteriorate, and our problem will be taken care of. Well, it's been almost 300 years since this miracle took place, and those hosts have not even started to deteriorate. When my wife and I were there in Siena, and we looked at these hosts, it was as if you went in the sacristy and opened a cellophane wrapper and took out hosts to be used in today's Mass. They're so fresh and intact. And there have been many scientific studies done, especially during the last hundred years, that have confirmed the authenticity of this miracle. If you take a consecrated host and you set it here on the table, and you come back six months from now, you're going to see major deterioration that's taken place to those unconsecrated hosts. You probably all had the experience of a loaf of bread that's set aside in the cupboard, and after a week or two, how it turns all green and yucky. Well, basically, we're seeing the same type of experience here. If you come back two years from now, those hosts will just change into a little powder, and a puff of wind will just blow it all away. And under the very best of environmental conditions, it might take as long as five years for those hosts to change into dust. But we're talking nearly three centuries, and they still have not begun to deteriorate. So the Vatican's International Exhibition of Eucharistic Miracles of the World that we have on display here today, I have less than half of all of the miracles that are in the full Vatican's exhibit. But if you want to explore more of the miracles than what you see here, if you go to our website, faithbasedcom.com, and click on the Eucharistic Miracles link, and then click on this green text that'll pop up, that'll take you to a summary of every one of the miracles, and there'll be links there that'll take you to all of these panels so that you can see them in exactly the same format that we have on display. As you're going through the exhibit, at the very top, you'll see where and when the miracle took place. The most important thing to pay attention to is off to the left here in red where the summary of the miracle is. But if you hear me talking about a miracle or you read the summaries and you want more information, then you'll have the detailed descriptions down below. In most cases, we have one panel that corresponds to a single miracle, but sometimes there are two or three panels, so therefore the there's arrows on the tables to help guide you in the right direction, so you're reading the stories from beginning to end. And also, we've discovered that ever since we put these arrows out on the table, there have been a lot less fistfights from people going in opposite directions and colliding. Okay? If you happen to have any young children with you and you bring them through the exhibit, there's a little red heart in the upper left-hand corner of many of the panels. Those are the ones that we feel are much help friendly. But there's no specific order to the exhibit. For your information, the last two uh, panels on the left of the back table back there are the Miracles of Lanciano and Santorin in Portugal, that you'll hear me talk about, that are two of the most famous Eucharistic miracles. And the first five panels here, closest to me on both sides, are miracles that have taken place within the last 25 years or so. So have lots of scientific study involved in these particular miracles. We have a pious bomber who 
host, stole the host, because he wanted Jesus with him at all times. So he took his walking staff and he cut a little groove in the top of the walking staff and he took that host and he put it into the groove. And each day after he got his animals settled, he'd take his walking staff and he'd stick it in the ground and he would kneel down there in prayer before our Lord. This went on for quite some time, everything was fine. But one day he discovered he could not get his animals to calm down. Perhaps there was a wolf nearby. We don't know what was causing them to be so restless. But he became more and more frustrated at those animals. And in his frustration, he took his walking staff and he threw it at the animals. And when he did, the host fell out of that groove and went onto the ground. Well, he immediately ran over to try and recover the host. But he discovered that he could not lift that host. So at that point, he had to go to his pastor and confess to what he had done. And his pastor came, and his pastor was unable to recover the host. So the pastor had to go to the bishop in Regensburg, and the bishop came, and the bishop was unable to recover the host. So finally, the bishop made a promise to God, and he said, if I'm allowed to recover the host, I will build a church here and honor the Blessed Sacrament. And as soon as he made that promise, he was then able to recover the host. We have a priest that was called to administer the last rites. When he gets to the home, he takes his bag and sets it on a little table there in the entry hall and goes in to hear the confession of this dying person. And while he's in there, there's another person in the house that happens to be in serious sin and comes down and sees the priest's bag, rummages through it looking for something worth stealing, opens the picks, doesn't see anything there he wants, closes everything up, leaves the scene. Eventually, the priest comes out, and he's ready to administer communion to this dying person. He takes his bag, goes in, opens it up. When he opens the pigs, he discovers that the host is bleeding, and it's stuck to the bottom of the pigs. So at that point, he's really not sure what to do with this nearby Benedictine monastery. So he says, well, I'll go to the experts and ask them what I should do about all this. So he gets his bag all together and he starts walking off in the direction of the monastery and while he's going, he goes past this herd of sheep and all of the sheep kneel down in adoration as he passes by. When he finally gets to the monastery and they open the pigs, he discovered that on the surface of the host is the face of Jesus crowned with thorns. Now this is not the picture of that particular host is a painting that was done by a Russian bishop I find to be a very powerful image. This next story takes place in Calanda in Spain. But it has a lot to do with the town of Zaragoza, so I have to set the stage for you. On January the 2nd, in the year 40, a Blessed Mother bilocated this is not, you know, an apparition. This, mean, this is when she was still alive. So she was in two places at the same time. So she appears to St. James, who's sitting at the edge of a river, really feeling sorry for himself because things are not going the way he had hoped in terms of his evangelization efforts. So he's really depressed. So Mary appears to him, and she's in the middle of a river standing on this column of jasper. And she offers him encouragement. She tells him things will turn around. He'll be very successful in his efforts. And she asks that a church be built there. And when they did build that church, it was the very first church dedicated to our Blessed Mother. And the people of Spain have had this great devotion to Our Lady of the Pillar, Our Lady of Zaragoza, because Our Lady also left that pillar there as a reminder of her visit to St. James that day. So this is the basilica there in Zaragoza, where you can see the pillar today. As you go in the main entrance of the church, you're confronted with a couple of big bombs, each of which are bigger than me. And what happened is during the 1936 Spanish Civil War, there were three bombs that were dropped on that church, none of which exploded, which obviously spared the church but also this wonderful pillar that Mary had appeared on. And here we have St. John Paul II venerating the pillar there within 
the Basilica. So getting back to Colando, we have a young man. His name is Miguel Juan Melesia, and he's 20 years old. And he happens to slip and fall at a really bad time because there's a wagon loaded with grain that's passing by and his right leg slips out from under him and goes under the wheel of the wagon and all the legs in his body and uh, all the bones in his right leg are all crushed. So he manages to fashion a crutch and get himself 75 miles from Kalanda to Zaragoza because he wants to go there and pray to Our Lady of the Pillar, Our Lady of Zaragoza for healing. By the time he finally arrives in Zaragoza, he goes to the Royal Hospital of Grace. And the doctors examine him and they say, well, your leg is totally infected, it's gangrene. You're going to die unless you let us amputate your leg, which he allowed them to do. So the doctors prepared all of their medical records about this patient, what his condition was, the fact that they amputated his leg and buried it in the local cemetery. Once he finally felt well enough to leave the hospital, each day he would attend mass there in Zaragoza. And you're all familiar with the red candle that we have next to the tabernacle to remind us that Jesus is truly present there within the tabernacle. Well, the tabernacle lamp that they had back then was an oil lamp. So as he went into church each day, he'd go over to that oil lamp, he'd dip his fingers into the oil, and he would rub the stump of his leg with that oil. And he continued to do this for three years, at the end of which he decided to head back home to Kalanda. So he took some of the oil with him, and when he got home, he began a novena to the Blessed Mother. And each day again, he would take some of that oil, and he'd rub the stump of his leg with that oil. And on the last day in the novena, he told his mom, you know, I'm feeling really tired, so I'm gonna go lay down. So he goes into his mom's bedroom, lays down on the floor, covers himself up with a blanket, and goes to sleep. Well, later that afternoon, his mom is really concerned. This is not normal behavior for her son, so she goes in to investigate. When she goes in there, she discovers that there are two legs poking out from under that blanket. He had miraculously recovered that missing leg. We have the Blessed Sacrament. An adoration in this church in Avignon, in France. And we have this flood that comes and inundates the whole town. And the water is nine feet high on the outside of the church. And a couple of Franciscan friars said, we need to go rescue the Blessed Sacrament because obviously it's in great distress with this flood. So they borrow a rowboat and they row, row over to the church. And when they open the doors of the church, much to their amazement, oops, Much to their amazement, they discovered that the aisle up to the altar was completely dry, even though the water was like four feet high at the edges of the walls here. They were able to go up and recover the monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament. There was no damage done. And even books that were under the altar were spared, and there was no damage done to them. Now, personally, I think that Cecil B. DeMille probably had access to this stained glass window when he was trying to figure out how to film the crossing of the Red Sea and the Ten Commandments. The avoidance of natural calamities. 1906, we had a tremendous earthquake in San Francisco that did lots of damage. But that same year, there was another earthquake in South America, Colombia. Near the town of Tamaco, this is where the epicenter was of this earthquake. It was 10 times more powerful than the one that hit San Francisco. There was a tsunami, 16 foot high, that reached all the way over to Japan. I don't have a picture of this particular tsunami, but this is the one that took place in Fukushima in Japan just a few years ago. And you can see from the height of these vehicles that this tsunami wave has to be something on the order of 16 feet similar to what they experienced in, in uh, Tamaka. So at the end of this earthquake, which lasted for 10 minutes, the pastor, Father Gerardo Lorando, went to the tabernacle. 
and he consumed all of the small hosts that were there. But he took the large host and he put it in a monstrance, and he and his parishioners processed down to where the tsunami wave was coming in. I probably would have been heading for the hills, but they processed down to the tsunami wave. And when they got there to the edge of the water, Father Gerardo held up the Eucharist in the monstrance, made the sign of the cross, and suddenly that tsunami wave stopped. It just paused there, and then it receded and went back out to the ocean. In the headlines in the newspapers throughout the world the following day, talked about how the town of Tamako had been spared through the actions of Father Gerardo and the power of the Blessed Sacrament. And there are many stories within the Vatican's exhibit of various types of natural calamities having been avoided through similar actions on the part of priests with the Blessed Sacrament, where floods have been stopped, wildfires, like to bring your attention for that one with all of the fires you've had here locally, right? The plague. We had a town where a large percentage of the population in the town had been wiped out by the plague. And finally, the priest wised up. He took the remaining parishioners up to a hilltop. He blessed the parish, the town with the Blessed Sacrament. And from that day forward, there wasn't a single person in that town that died from the plague. And every year since then, they go up to that hilltop and have a procession up there to commemorate how the Blessed Sacrament saved them from the plague. Even volcanoes have been, were ready to wipe out a town, and again, with the power of the Blessed Sacrament, it changes direction, and the town is saved. When I think of all these, of witnesses and natural calamities, it reminds me of the time that Jesus is in the boat with his apostles. And the waves are crashing into the boat. And Jesus is asleep on the cushion in the front of the boat. And the apostles go over and they wake up Jesus and they say, Don't you care? We're about to sink here. And Jesus gets up and looks around and turns to them and says, Oh, ye of little faith. And he stands up and he just commands the wind and the sea to be calm. And suddenly we have this great silence. And the apostles turn to one another and they say, well, who is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Well, it's the same Jesus that was in the boat that day with the apostles. That's there in the Blessed Sacrament that's responsible for the avoidance of all these natural calamities. We have St. Clair in the town of Assisi. And we have a very large company of Saracen soldiers. We know them as Muslims today. They have overtaken the town and are about to enter the convent. And St. Clair is praying for the protection of her nuns. And she hears a voice say, I will always protect you. So then she began to pray for protection for the city. And the voice answered, it will have to undergo trials but it will be defended by my protection. And at that point, St. Clair went and she got the Blessed Sacrament, put it in her monstrance, and she and her nuns processed out to where these Muslim soldiers, the Saracens, were. And as soon as those saw, soldiers saw the Blessed Sacrament, they went into panic mode. They left the town of Assisi as quickly as possible. They were even jumping over the city walls that just a few hours before their comrades were being killed trying to conquer the town. So again, through the actions of St. Clair and the power of the Blessed Sacrament, the town of Assisi was spared that day. We have St. John Bosco. He's celebrating Mass on the Feast of the Annunciation of 360 young people. When it came time to distribute communion, his altar server comes over, takes the lid off the ciborium, and goes over to John Bosco and says, we have a problem. There were only eight hosts there. 
Well, John Bosco wasn't the least bit concerned. He said a few prayers, went about distributing communion, and those hosts replicated, and he was able to distribute communion to everyone that was there that day. Well, apparently Giuseppe was rather impressed because he became one of the very first Salesian priests, which was the order of priests that was founded by St. John Bosco. We have a fire that takes place in the Benedictine Abbey on the Feast of Pentecost. And the fire destroyed the altar and all the sacred furnishings there in the church. When they finally get the flames out and they're walking through the church assessing all the damage, someone happens to look up at the ceiling and there's the monstrance up there with the Blessed Sacrament that was up for adoration. And it stayed there day after day after day. So someone said, well, let's build a new altar with the old altar in there. So they do that. Blessed Sacrament's still up there. So finally someone said, well, let's celebrate Mass. And as they're celebrating Mass, that host just gradually descended down with the monstrance onto the altar. And that's been over 400 years. And that host is still miraculously preserved there in Feverny in France. We have a soldier that goes into the church, goes into the tabernacle, and removes the ciborium. And on the way out of church, he takes it and he just throws it at a stone wall. And when he does, the lid pops off. But the host, rather than going onto the ground, each levitate up into the air above him and give off this great bright light. Well, he immediately repented and he started to cry. Word of mouth spread, all the people in the town all collected, and those hosts stayed there for a very long time, and all the people in the town signed all these documents attesting to what they had witnessed that day. You are what you eat. Every 35 days, your skin replaces itself. Your liver does that once every month. So your body makes these new cells from the food that you eat. So what you eat literally becomes you. So I have four examples within the exhibit that we have on display of people who have lived for a very long time on nothing but the Blessed Sacrament. This is Therese Neumann in Germany. She fasted for 36 years on nothing but the Blessed Sacrament. When she was 20 years old, she was helping to fight a fire. It was an accident, and she was injured, and she was blinded and paralyzed as a result of those injuries. Five years later, she was miraculously cured of both the paralysis and the blindness. One year later, she's now at the age of 26, and she receives the stigmata wounds of Jesus. And she relives our Lord's passion every single Friday. And each Friday, those stigmata wounds would bleed profusely and her garments would be soaked in blood. Well, this was during the time that Hitler was in power there in Germany. And Hitler was very interested in the occult and the supernatural, and he was aware of Therese, and he was actually terrified of her. But he also knew that she wasn't eating anything, so he had her food rationing coupon taken away and had a second rationing coupon for soap issued to her so she could use that in order to wash the blood from the wounds each week. If you look carefully at this photograph, you can actually see on the back of her wrist the exit wound in the nail as part of her stigmata wounds. This woman, Maria da Costa in Portugal, fasted 13 years on the Eucharist. When she was 14 years old, she jumped out of a window in order to escape an attack from three young men in order to maintain her purity. She was injured in that fall and paralyzed. She relived our Lord's passion 182 times. And the doctors heard that she wasn't eating anything, 
So they said, well, this is totally impossible. Nobody could possibly do that. So they said, we just need to catch who's bringing her food and water. So they put together a team to monitor her. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, week after week after week. Nobody was bringing her any form of nourishment or even liquids. So they finally declared it had to be a miraculous event. But what I really like about Maria is this message that she received from Jesus in which he told her, I have put you in the world so that you may draw life only from me. To bear witness to the world how precious the Eucharist is. We have a woman whose husband is not being faithful to her. So she goes to a sorceress and explains this problem. And the sorceress says, I can take care of that. I can make a love potion that will take care of this issue with your husband. You just need to bring me a consecrated host, which she agrees to do. She goes to church, steals, less a sacrament, wraps it up in a handkerchief. And on the way home, she discovers that that host has started to bleed. So when she gets home, she has this wooden chest in the house. She opens it up and takes it and puts it in the bottom of the wooden chest, closes it up, goes about doing her daily chores. Eventually, her husband returns home from work. They have the evening meal. It's starting to get dark out. And the husband can see that this is bright light that's shining out through some of the cracks in that wooden chest. So he goes over to investigate. When he opens the lid of the chest, this great bright light fills the whole room. At that point, her wife, his wife had to confess to what she had done. And the pastor came and collected the host in that great procession to bring it back to the church. And that host continued to bleed for three additional days. And they collected some of the blood here within this vessel. And the host itself is still miraculously preserved. That's been over 750 years. And you can see the host here with the blood stains on it. So this is in Santa Rima in Portugal. And there's been lots of scientific study done to confirm the authenticity of this particular miracle. And it's one of the more famous ones. We have a doubting priest. And during the consecration, the wine turned into blood. And the blood began to boil and overflow the chalice and spill out. And that blood remained fresh for 170 years after this particular event. We have a priest who just accidentally dropped a host. So he bent over to pick it up, and when he did, the host just lifted up in flight, and it went over to the altar, and it landed on a purificator. And it transformed into this wonderful child that everyone that was there at Mass that day was able to observe. And again, this host has been preserved for over 750 years there in Douai, France. Again, we have a doubting priest. And during the consecration, the corpus on the crucifix came alive and it reached out and it took the chalice away from the priest and it held it up for several minutes for the people who were there at that mass to venerate. When the chalice was handed back to the priest, he was able to finish the mass. At the end of the mass, he came out, kissed the feet of the crucifix, left the church, and was never seen again. He ended up entering a monastery where he stayed until the time of his death. This is a photograph of the actual corpus associated with this particular miracle. We have an arrogant nobleman, and his name is Oswald Milzer. When it came time for communion, he insisted that he wanted the large host that the priest had consecrated. He didn't want one of those little ones that were reserved for all the common people like you and me. Well, at first the priest resisted, but then the knights that were there with Oswald began to draw their swords and the priest was fearing for his life, so he said, fine, okay, okay, I'll give you the large host. 
So the priest administers communion to Oswell. And suddenly, the ground beneath his feet began to tremble, and he started to sink into the earth. And he started screaming, and he reached out, and he grabbed the side of the altar, which is a stone altar. And it suddenly changed into like a set waxy substance, so that his hands started to sink into the surface of the altar. And finally, the priest removed the host, and it started to bleed. When I researched scripture, I was able to find three instances of people having been sucked or swallowed by the earth as a result of doing things unfavorable to the Lord. And if you happen to go to Seefeld, Austria today, there beside the altar, you'll see the hole into which Oswald was getting swallowed, which has been covered up with a metal grate in order to keep other people from falling in there. You can see they have a nice new modern altar in place, but beneath it they have the remainder of the original altar associated with this miracle because in the stone you can actually see the handprints from Oswald from this particular event. Now it turns out that Oswald ended up entering a monastery and became a monk as a result of what he experienced that day. My favorite category of Eucharistic miracles are those that involve reverent animal behaviors. Let's face it, animals are going to do what's ever natural to them. They're not influenced by any promises of wealth or power. They're just going to do what's natural. If you go home this evening and you tell your goldfish, I'll give you a million dollars if you jump through this hoop, they're just going to keep swimming around in there. St. Anthony of Padua was often trying to convert heretics. And this one day he became very frustrated because nobody was paying attention to him. In his frustration, he went over to the edge of the river and started preaching there. And suddenly fish started coming over to the edge of the river bank where he was. And the fish started lining up with the little fish closest to the edge and the bigger fish further back. And they're lining up and they're bobbing there in the water with their heads popping out, and they're paying attention to his preaching that day. Of course, we're all familiar with St. Francis and the wonderful experience that he had with the animals. And if you look at scripture, there's a number of references that indicate that God cares about all of his creation, not just us as people, okay? In Mark 16, 15, it says, go into all the world, and proclaim the gospel to the whole of creation. But isn't that what we see happening here? Psalm 66, 4. All the earth worships you and sings praise to you. Romans 8, 19. For all creation is waiting eagerly. So my favorite Eucharistic miracle takes place in Alvaroya in Spain. And we have a priest who's taking communion to some sick parishioners within the parish. So he gets a saborium, puts the host in there, gets on his donkey, and heads off in the direction of their, their homes. They come to a river, and they're crossing the river, and the donkey slips, and the priest falls off. The lid falls off the saborium, the host go into the river, the current takes everything away, and he's just left there thrashing about. Well, the next thing he knows, he hears these fishermen that are downstream. And they're yelling out to him. They say, Father, Father, you've got to come here and see this. There's these fish, and they're mostly out of the water, and they're carrying these little white discs in their mouth. Well, the priest didn't even bother to go and investigate. He runs back to the church to get another saborium. In the meantime, word of mouth spreads. The town's there at the edge of the river, and the whole town collects, and they're all watching these fish holding the little white discs in their mouth. The priest finally returns with the saborium. He goes over to the edge of the river, kneels down, holds out the saborium, and those fish come over one by one and drop the host into the saborium, and he's able to recover them, and there's no damage to the host. Well, the people in this town did not want to ever forget about the miracle that took place there. They decided to build this huge monument 
to the fish holding these hosts in their mouth. If you look at the size of these cars, these six-story apartment buildings, those, that monument has to be some 50, 60 feet tall. Personally, I think the donkey got the last stuff. Yeah, the last laugh in this story. He probably knew that his slip in the river was going to be for the greater glory of God. <laughs> Perhaps a more familiar Eucharistic miracle involving reverent animal behaviors. Again, starts with St. Anthony, Anthony of Padua trying to convert this heretic. And the heretic says, well, I can believe everything you've taught me about the Catholic faith except for one thing. There is no way I can possibly believe that Jesus would make himself present in this little wafer of bread. So they agreed that they would have the heretic lock up his mule in the barn for three days and not feed him throughout that period of time. At the end of three days, they let the mule out of the barn. He's starving, very, very hungry. The heretic is there with fodder to feed his mule. But Saint Anthony is there with the Blessed Sacrament. And that mule comes out, ignores the food, and goes down and kneels in adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. So that heretic ended up becoming a very zealous convert to the Catholic faith. So the most famous Eucharistic miracle, the one that's undergone the greatest amount of scientific study, is one that took place around the year 750 in the town of Marciano in Italy. And it began with a doubting priest. And at the moment of the consecration, the bread turned into flesh, and the wine turned into blood. And everyone who was there at Mass that day witnessed this miracle as it took place. And the flesh remains intact to this day. When my wife and I were there in Lachiano, we were there on a Eucharistic miracles tour. And nearly everybody in our group were Catholic couples except for this one Protestant minister and his wife. And after we had celebrated Mass in the chapel behind the altar, we came out and we made a circle around the monstrance containing the sacred species of this miracle. And we're very close to it. And this minister's wife begins to say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she starts to sob, and her sobs became more and more intense, and she got to the point where she couldn't even control herself to stand anymore. So her husband and I sat her down in a pew, and we went off and we found a wheelchair, and we were able to wheel her off to where our bus was, our tour bus. And it took us about an hour to calm her down to the point where we could get her back on the bus and resume our tour that day. She was so moved at being in the presence of this miracle here in Lanciano. Now the blood coagulated into five lumps, each the size of a walnut. And if you weigh any one of those lumps, all five of the lumps, or any combination of two, three, or four, you get exactly the same weight. Well, that seems rather impossible. Archbishop Rodriguez explained this phenomenon. He said, well, Christ is totally present in the smallest fragment of consecrated host, or in the smallest drop of consecrated wine. Now the blood itself, when it was analyzed, is blood type AB. If you look at the Shroud of Torrens, Odarium of Oviedo, Tunic of Argente, all of the Eucharistic miracles where they've had an opportunity to type the blood, it's always blood type AB, which is the rarest form of blood. Only 3.2% of the human population has blood type AB. So the host transformed into this flesh that you see here. There are no preservatives. The flesh is human myocardium. It's a left ventricle of a human heart. It has all the arteries, the veins, the vagus nerve, everything that you'd expect to find. 
When I think about this miracle, it reminds me of the prophecy of Ezekiel, in which he said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. As you're about to hear, this is happening in town after town after town where the host is being transformed into heart tissue. I'd like to tell you a little about St. Longinus. The centurion at the foot of the cross that pierced Jesus' heart with the lance. And as we know, blood and water came flowing out from our Lord. And some of that happened to go on his eyes. And he had some sort of eye defect, which is probably why he was on a crucifixion detail rather than being out in fighting battles. And he immediately recovered his full sight when Jesus' blood touched him. And he said from the foot of the cross, truly, this was the Son of God. He became a Christian, and he was evangelizing, and the Romans weren't too appreciative of that, so they cut out his tongue, and he still managed to evangelize, so they chopped off his head. So he became a martyr, and he was a saint. Well, he was from a town in Italy called Exanum. Well, the people of Exanum said, well, we have this saint from our town. So they decided to rename the town Lanciano. And they, the church there within the town was called the Church of St. Longinus. And it's within that church that we have this Eucharistic miracle that took place. It's one of the most famous Eucharistic miracles. So we have St. Longinus piercing the heart of Jesus and then within the church within the church named in his honor, in the town named, renamed for him, we have the host change into heart tissue. In 1973, the World Health Organization was granted permission to run this test scientific tests on the sacred species here in Lanciano. They spent 15 months running over 500 tests. And they were completely baffled because every test that they ran on this 1,250-year-old piece of heart tissue came back as if it was still alive. And when they put together their final report, they said that science, aware of its limits, has come to a halt face to face with the impossibility of giving an explanation. So I've listed a few of the recent Eucharistic miracles that have become part of the Vatican's exhibit here. The ones in yellow are the ones that have actually changed into heart tissue. And talk about one that took took place in 1996 in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. Now, Eucharistic miracles are not ordinarily approved in Rome. It's up to the local bishop where the miracle takes place to put together the investigating commission and make the determination as to the authenticity of the miracle. So the bishop in Buenos Aires at the time that this miracle took place, Bishop Picoglio, was someone we happen to know today as Pope Francis. So it begins with a discarded host. In the position the church is, if you have a host that you can't consume, you place it in water, and within two or three days it dissolves, and then you can use that water to water a plant or a tree, and basically return it back to nature. So they did this, However, it did not dissolve, and after eight days, it had turned bloody. And after three weeks, it had become much larger, and it turned into bloodied flesh. And it did not deteriorate even after several years. So at the end of three years, they decided to send a sample to the United States and San Francisco to a company called Forensic Analytical Sciences, a laboratory there. They didn't tell them anything about the sample. They just said, would you please take a look at this and tell us what it is? 
So they did, and they put together their report, and they said, well, it's real flesh and blood, and it contains human DNA. Heart muscle, myocardium, left ventricle of a human heart. And what they were concerned about is that it, the person had to have been alive when the sample was taken. So what they were worried about is these people that brought the sample to them took someone outside their office door, killed them, tore open their chest, ripped out the heart, took a slice of the heart, brought it in, and said, hey, would you take a look at this and analyze it? Because it had to have been less than 15 minutes old at the time they received it. Five years later, it went out eight years into this Eucharistic miracle. A sample was sent to Dr. Zukova in New York, who's the chief medical pathologist for one of the counties there. He's done tens of thousands of autopsies. He's written a book about the fact that if he's presented with the heart of a deceased person, he can tell you from just examining the heart what contributed to their death. So they bring the sample in to Dr. Zogaba. He puts it under his microscope and starts to look at it. And he says, oh, I can tell you exactly what this is. It's myocardium. It's a left ventricle of the heart. It's the muscle that gives the heart its beat and gives life to the body. And then he continues to look at it. And he says, the presence of intact white blood cells indicated that the sample was pulsating at the moment it was taken. And he said that the heart's owner endured much suffering as indicated by thrombi, caused by a lack of oxygen due to painful breathing. So we get these reports back in Buenos Aires. They said, well, you know, why didn't anyone tell us this before? So they dug out this report that was done at the very beginning of this Eucharistic miracle by a little local laboratory there in Buenos Aires. And sure enough, the technician had recorded in his inscribble notes as he studied this under the microscope, he said he could see that the cells were beating. So Dr. Ricardo Castagnon was the person that was sitting selected by Bishop Ricardo to head up this investigation. And Dr. Castagnon says, well, we have these two Eucharistic miracles, 1,250 years apart, the one in Lanciano in Italy and the one taking place in Buenos Aires in Argentina. What are some of the similarities that we see when we look at this scientific data? Well, both samples were type AB blood. DNA indicated it was characteristic of a man, a man from the Middle Eastern region. And when they studied the DNA in detail, they said that it had to have come from the very same person. The probability of it having come from a different person, they said, was less than one in 200 billion. So Dr. Castagnon, who had been a staunch atheist throughout his entire life, ended up converting to Catholicism as a result of his experience with this investigative team in approving this Eucharistic miracle. 20 years later, Tixla, Mexico. A bleeding host is discovered within the ciborium during the distribution of communion. The blood originated from the interior of the host and flowed outward. It was human blood, blood type. A, B. So it's not blood sitting on the surface of the host. At three months, they discovered that it was live cardiac tissue, muscle, okay, heart tissue, myocardium, which would normally die within 48 hours, but we're three months into this miracle. At four years, as you can imagine, the blood that was there on the surface of the host is coagulated, so it's like you know, a scab that you might have on your body. And we've probably all had the experience of picking at a scab and uh, what happens. Blood typically comes to the surface, right? So they scraped a little bit of the blood from the surface of this host, and new blood came from the interior of the host and flowed out four years into this miracle.
Two years later, Sokolka in Poland. A priest who just accidentally drops the hose and is placed in the vasculum, the little water hole that the priest would use to wash his fingers after the distributing communion. That container was then locked in the safe. One week later, the host had mostly dissolved, but red clots began to appear in the center. At the end of 17 days, they transferred this material onto a corporal. And if you look here, you can see the embroidered cross here within the corporal. And this would be the host with the blood. But you'll notice that a portion of the host still looks like a host, and the remainder looks like bloodied flesh. It's very tightly interconnected. This bloody flesh is not something sitting on the surface of the host. The host has transformed into this flesh. Three months. They have two independent medical examiners that know nothing about the provenance of in terms of where this has come from or the, the fact that it's associated with some alleged Eucharistic miracle. And they both report that it's myocardium, again, or heart tissue. They say that there are indications that it was alive. And that it showed signs of the fast spasm of the cardiac muscle that is typical of the extreme phase that precedes death. So just prior to our dying, the heart's trying to keep us alive and starts going through this very rapid uh, spasms in order to try and pump more heart and uh, blood to our bodies and provide more nutrients. And they can detect evidence of that within these samples. When they examined it under a scanning electron microscope, Again, it confirmed everything that they had reported previously. So this is the scanning electron microscope, and this is just a sketch of what uh, cardiac tissue would normally look like. There was no evidence of deterioration that would normally be expected after this period of time. And as is true of any Eucharistic miracle that's reported today, one of the very first things they look for is any evidence of bacteria, because there are bacteria that look like blood. Okay? So they immediately check to make sure that they don't have some bacteria that uh, could be contributing to a false report of a Eucharistic miracle. Five years later, Lake Mika in Poland, Christmas Day of 2013. We have a priest who accidentally dropped the host. They placed it in water, expecting it to dissolve. But after two weeks, it had not dissolved, and blood appeared. At one month into this miracle, they took a sample, and they provided it to scientists for analysis. And immediately, they rolled, it, rolled out any bacteria, mold, fungus as being contributing to this particular, uh, what, what they were observing. The scientific analysis indicated it was myocardium. So they then had a second scientific facility investigate it, and they also concluded that it was myocardium with alterations that appear during agony. And again, they had no knowledge of what this sample was associated with. And they said it had human DNA. And after three years of analyzing their data in April of 2016, they finally came forward and the bishop announced that it was an authentic Eucharistic miracle. So this is the most recent Eucharistic miracle that is part of the Vatican's exhibit. And the panel is right here on my right. So most of us will go through life and not have the opportunity to experience the type of miracles we've been discussing here this evening. 
Well, we certainly don't want to be like Doubting Thomas, who say, well, I'm not going to believe that Jesus is resurrected until I can put my fingers into the wounds of his side. We have all of these wondrous miracles over 2,000 years demonstrating the true presence of Jesus within the Blessed Sacrament. We have his words in Scripture. We know that Jesus is truly present. And we're familiar with our Lord during his agony in the garden and how he kept asking the apostles to come with him in prayer. And how the apostles kept falling asleep. They were too tired to, sleep, to pray with Jesus. And finally Jesus turned to Peter and said, Could you not watch one hour with me? I'd like to encourage you to participate in Eucharistic adoration within your parishes or nearby parishes if you don't have it available. Jesus is there in the Blessed Sacrament. And he's waiting for you to come and join him, keep him company. Very powerful to be there in the presence of Jesus. It reminds me of a poem that goes, Whenever I pass a church, I stop and make a visit. So when I'm carried in feet first, God won't say, who is it? As you go through the exhibit today, you're going to find several things available that are there for you to take with you. We have these pink flyers associated with the Miracle Manciano, and if for some reason you don't see any of these uh, on display, we have plenty up here, so just come ask for them, and you can take as many as you wish. And we also have these devotional cards associated with the Miracle Manciano. And we have our business card there, and I'd like you to take this, and you can tear it in half and throw away all the information about us. What we want you to have is the face of Jesus from the Shrouded Torah, and keep those in your wallets or purses, and just have it with you at all times. But should you decide to keep the cards intact, there's contact information for us, and if you know of any people that... Uh, uh, friends, relatives, anyone in the country that you think might be interested in having us bring this to their parishes, schools, religious communities, we'd be happy to do that. There's absolutely no charge, no reimbursement expenses. We don't take up a goodwill collection. We don't sell anything for profit. So hopefully at least they'll be able to afford us. So what I'd like to do at this point is just open up the floor to any questions you might have, and we'll try and answer those for you. Is there anything in the United States that's pending? I do have a table at the very back that is not part of the uh, Vatican's exhibit that has a number of panels on it. It's a round table. Uh, the blue panels that are there, background, uh, are reported in the United States. The red panels are other reported miracles in other countries. Uh, I, wherever I go, I have people coming up to me after the presentations telling me about Eucharistic miracles they've experienced personally or someone within their family or within their parish. I'm always hearing these Eucharistic miracle stories. So I know that this is something that's happening all over the country here in the United States. And uh, it's just that uh, these miracles typically don't get to the point where they've been approved by the bishop and included into the, the Vatican's exhibition. Uh, I can't explain why it is that happens, but I know in most cases that when there's a Eucharistic miracle that takes place here in the United States, the bishops either order that it be destroyed or consumed. And so I don't know what the rationale is for that, but I've heard of priests that They've had this Eucharistic miracle, they've been told to destroy it, they go in and they try and tear this host that's changed into flesh and they can't tear it because it, it is flesh now. Whereas obviously it was just bread that had uh, been soaking in water for some period of time. It would be very simple to tear apart. Next question. Asking about the spear that's in the back. Okay, we have a replica of a first century Roman lance, which is called a pilum, 
which is basically a battle type of lance. It's, it's kind of like a 50 caliber machine gun that would be used today in battle, okay? Within the panels behind there is a picture of the actual uh, spearhead associated with the piercing of Jesus' side, which was on a hasta type of lance, which was a very lightweight uh, lance that a soldier could easily carry around all day, with kind of like a, a sidearm today that a policeman might carry. But it's a very different type of lance, and that is supposedly the actual head of the lance that pierced Jesus' side. It's kept within this rather elaborate vase that has a, a, a top on it. So that's probably what you were looking at. Now the two things that we do have that are not uh, replicas uh, are but we do have relics over here on your right of the true cross and we have a relic, a piece of bone from St. Longinus and of course they're there for you to reverence. Next question. Okay, the question has to do with the fact that in the early days of the church, or in, I really can't say the old, early days of the church, but uh, when we were children, uh, that at that time only the priest could touch the consecrated host, we were not allowed to touch it with our hands, and nobody else was allowed to touch it other than the priest. And the question is, why has this changed? I can't say for certain, but I would speculate that the reason it has changed is for an economy of time, where parishioners don't want to hang around with the priest distributes communion to everyone within the parish. So they've decided to have the extraordinary ministers of Eucharist to help distribute communion. So obviously we have other people that are now touching the host other than the priest. And why it is that we as parishioners are now allowed to receive it in the hand as opposed to on the tongue, I don't have any explanation for that. But uh, I know it, there are many people that are very upset that the church now allows that. But I, I don't understand the rationale for it. Yes? Just to kind of follow up on this question, there is a website called churchmilton.com. Uh, some of the materials actually talk about the background of how extraordinary Sometimes there's there's uh, times that I have I have witnessed uh, people who are Eucharistic ministers stacking the the bowls of the, 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 the blessed sacrament on top of each other as if they're taking a, a piece of dish from the kitchen. You do it. And it is really very important that we, the lady, start showing reverence for our Lord, because that is our Lord. How can we evangelize and tell everyone else about the Catholic faith if we ourselves do not ourselves show reverence and teach our kids to show reverence to Him, our Lord, present to us in the Blessed Eucharist? Our hands cannot just be, you know, assigned to touch the Blessed Eucharist. I, my family and I have started attending the Latin Mass. 
And I didn't grow up at all seeing the Latin Mass, but I wept when I saw the reverence and how the priest would make sure that none of the precious particles would be, or would be wasted. Okay. So please, pray and show reverence to the Eucharist because our priests, unfortunately, many of them are not educated enough. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, 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 you very much. Of course, we just heard that churchmilitant.com has a lot of information for us about uh, this particular issue. Okay, well, I certainly want to thank you all for your uh, coming this evening and spending time with us.